Beyond the Ranch with Jay Gannon from Find the Ranch. Welcome to Beyond the Wrench. I am your host, Jay Gannon. Today, we welcome Ben Zimmerman to the program. Ben is a teacher of the shop program at the Verona High School, uh, located just down the road from us in Verona, Wisconsin. And, and they really just built a brand new state-of-the-art facility that I, I want to talk to Ben about and, and really understand what they're going through as a high school program. And really, we, we often hear about how shop classes are not available for our young people. So I wanted to highlight a program that was making it happen. And uh, just randomly, we get to do this on World Teachers Day. Welcome to the show, Ben. Not sure if you knew it was World Teachers Day, but I wanted to wish Happy Teachers Day to you. Oh, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? Good. Did you know it was World Teachers Day? I did not. All right. Well, it's just a, a basically an extra holiday for you. So you're, you're in good shape. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, similar to other podcasts that we start, I want to talk about how you got to uh, kind of where you're at as a as a high school teacher. Uh, walk us through a little bit of, you know, what drew you to the industry and then kind of what took your path down uh, the education route. Uh, I got drawn into industry. Just I was always taking things apart, putting them together. Uh, replace, you know, in high school and just after replacing brakes for friends and working on cars and all of that. And, you know, I was working for a company and moving, spotting semi trailers. And I just, I couldn't decide. I had no idea what to do. And they just went, you know what, we have a spot available for a diesel tech. Why don't you go to school? We'll get you set up with some tuition reimbursement. And you know, I started school and worked out pretty well for me you know, managed to finish in the two years when I was supposed to and got pretty good grades and it went pretty well for me. Very cool. So how, what was the, you spent some time in industry, you spent time actually working on stuff, right? Yep. What, what was kind of the part of your path that was like, Hey, you know what, this education side seems like something that I really, really want to pursue. Uh, so I, you know, I, I did enjoy industry um, and I just, when I was, I worked for, let's see, I think it was probably 2013. Um, I just wanted to get back into coaching. And so mm -hmm. I started coaching wrestling with uh, one of the local districts and, you know, just really enjoyed working with the kids and the, the head coach that I was working with goes, you know, you're really good with the kids. And I'm assuming you're good in industry because you wouldn't have a job if you weren't. And you realize there's a huge shortage in tech ed teachers. Yes. And so I just did a little research and a couple of years later, I was, you know, I coached for three more years, kept working for three more years. And I was finally like, you know what? He's right. Like, why not try to give back some? That's awesome. And, and how, I mean, how has the transition gone? Do you, do you enjoy it? Uh, there's definitely days I miss my service truck. <laughs> there are days where it's just nice to hop in your truck and disappear and not talk to a soul. And just work on what you got to work on. Yep. Just work on it, you know, keep, keep, your, keep track of your service reports, just kind of space out and do your job. And uh, that, you know, there's days where I miss that. And there's also days to when you have that kid that's, really frustrated and you just watch it click and they get it and it's like yes that's exactly that's what you're there for yeah that that's that's really cool and i i applaud you for doing that because i think there's there's such a need for passionate educators especially in our industry because we we definitely it's no secret we we've, we've got a shortage of techs in the industry and and really kind of what we what we feel is that there's not only a shortage going in, but there's a, a, a lot of them leaving. So we're trying to create a better industry in general. And I think it takes more of, more of the education side to help drive some of this, right? And I think that's really what you're doing. And, and so talk to me a little bit about what you do every day. Like as far as, I know it's a little different right now in the virtual environment, but uh, talk to me a little bit about what, what classes you teach and kind of what all, what all goes into that. Yeah. So I teach a mix of automotive 
small engines and then uh, metal working. All right. Uh, and so I, the automotive uh, last year was my first year teaching true automotive. Um, and we had a, a consumer auto class set up and that consumer auto class is like, I made it as basic, like good vehicle ownership. That's good. it. Yeah. Uh, and not beyond that, you know, and I even, I, kids got frustrated with me because some definitely knew more than others, but it's like, all right, this is how you check your oil. This is how you check your transmission level and just plain good car ownership through and through like, and I told them when you're done with this, I want you to be able to, if you take your car to a shop and they give you like, oh, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong, you can check it yeah, and see, is that actually wrong? Now, I know 99% of shops out there are good shops, but sadly, the, the stigma wouldn't be there if there weren't some bad ones. Yeah. And so that's the way I run that class. And then uh, uh, I introduced two new or three new classes. One didn't get approved, but that's okay because the other two are prerequisites for it anyway. And so uh, an automotive one and automotive two. Uh, in the automotive one, it's kind of a brake steering and suspension class. We are only focusing on brake steering and suspension systems. And then the auto two is a little ambitious. There's no way I'm actually going to cover all of this, but it's uh, <laughs> electrical, manual transmissions, automatic transmissions, and drivetrains. And okay. that's very ambitious for a high school semester. Yeah. I, well, I like how you start with that core foundation of the, the brakes and steering uh, suspension uh, type of things because they're one i think there's some items that a student could do on their own you know to their own vehicle and and be safe with it uh but then two it sets maybe a foundation of just even getting familiar with tools to be able to go to that electrical side or be able to go to some of that other side of of uh, the business what's the range in kids you see in that that automotive one class like are you seeing is it uh you know anything from never touched a wrench to like farm kids that have all of the background? Well, this is Verona. There aren't exactly farm kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's definitely kids that like they, they've never touched a wrench. They have no idea what any of it's called. And so in that class, I cover safety in every class, no matter what, but in that class, I spend more time and the same with that consumer auto class, you know, this is what this tool is. This is what this tool is used for. Get their hands on it. Let them see it. Let them use it. Just get them exposed to that. So when I say, hey, give me, I need a half inch ratchet. They can actually grab me a half inch ratchet and hand it to me. Yeah. Um, and they can just kind of understand how all of that works. And then, yeah, to build up from there, um, you know, get them in a basic system, you know, I'd, I'd like to say they get an understanding of basic hydraulics. How many of them actually comprehend that is, you know, hydraulics aren't the simplest thing. No, it's tough. And so to, but have them understand, okay, a bigger piston, bigger surface area, you're going to get more braking power and just, you know, the basic difference between a conventional brake pad and a ceramic brake pad, or when you would move, when you would want to move to something a little more performance base. And then we also get pretty heavy into tires in that too. Great. Of, sizing if you do want to make a change how to calculate it and all of that kind of stuff what percentage of your students would you say and i know this is a, a pretty loaded question but would like to pursue something in automotive or diesel after after high school you're not going to like this answer no uh, it's probably under 20 yeah i'm actually surprised that you would even be that close i, I like it doesn't from from school teachers that I've talked to doesn't seem like there's even, even that level. Uh, but 20, say if it's 20% of the students that are in the shop class would show interest in, in taking it a step further. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, there's the other problem with that is I hear, you know, kids will, kids will tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. They're taking your class. Hey, who's interested in this? Kids will raise their hand that, maybe aren't interested in it or that are still a little confused and think being an engineer is actually hands-on. Yeah. So how do you, how do you really get to the core of like, okay, out of all of these kids, this, you know, these few are the ones that have kind of a legitimate career 
path toward that, or maybe their background sets them up for that, or they just have natural mechanical ability. Are you able to kind of see that, whether it's a level one or a level two class? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can see it right away in the level one, um, whether it's they've been exposed to it or it just kind of clicks with them. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely the kids that they get it, they work through it, you know, they, it's very simple to them. And those are, those typically tend to be the more, actually, I shouldn't say that. That's not right. I was going to say they're the more higher achieving students, but that's not the case. Yeah. And any level student, I've had that success. So one thing that stuck out to me when, when we started our conversation, even prior to the podcast was talking about the emphasis of a four-year education or four-year uh, degree as compared to sending a student into into maybe a trade school to go, you know, be an automotive technician or diesel technician. Do you get the sense from the high school level that there's still that pressure, uh, that there's still that pressure of going to a four-year school as compared to a, a maybe a trade school? Oh yeah, there's definitely that pressure, whether it be from the parents or the district. You know, I part of me wonders how many kids actually know I exist down in my wing. Oh yeah. I had seniors. So last year was my first year in Verona and I had kids that were seniors that came down and were, yeah, I didn't know this place existed. Wow. And so we're a big district. We have 1700 kids. Yeah. And so it is easy to get lost in the school and all of that. But the fact that kids didn't know we even offered classes like that is That's not insane. Fun. No, no, that is crazy. And so, but the, Wisconsin doesn't exactly do us a service either because our state report card is, has an emphasis on AP testing. And so AP testing and the amount of kids that take AP classes looks good on your state report card. So even the school cares more about, all right, we need to get kids into AP classes as opposed to the tech ed classes. And I guess that's how you make yourself look good. It's just a service to a big part of the country. So is I 100% agree. And I'm trying to figure that part out myself in terms of is, is that tied to grant money? Or is that tied to anything that is like, beneficial to the school outside of like, just the general best interest of a kid? The biggest thing it, it might get a little more state funding. I know if you drop below a certain point, your state funding goes away, gets decreased. It never completely goes away, but you know, the schools that are higher achieving get more money, yeah. uh, which is also a little backwards. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, I think the bigger thing is it incorporate, it makes a big draw on open enrollment. And so if you're not familiar, open enrollment in Wisconsin is kind of weird. So say, so you're in Mount Horeb, say we get 20 kids from Mount Horeb that open enrolled in Verona when the state funding check shows up to Mount Horeb, they write a check for X amount of money per student to Verona. Wow. And so that's a big draw. Also, it's another way for the school to make more money. And, you know, I'd love to say education hasn't turned into corporations, but when you have to fight for money, yeah, you do that's exactly what happens. Well, and I think that's at the core of it such an important piece to understand for everybody that's listening to this in general is schools are fighting for resources to be able to, to teach these classes. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, in industry, we're, we're saying, Oh, we're, we're taking away shop class. We're taking away shop class. Well, I, I think there are opportunities for us to, to help, uh, to help the schools and help them, create a program that's really strong that attracts those students. So when you have those 1700 students, they're crazy not to know about your program, right? And so I wanna maybe dive into that a little bit as well. Talk a little bit about what you get for a budget for being able to, to get tooling or get you know training materials or training aids, whether it's a, a vehicle or a transmission or an engine or you know whatever it is what kind of support do you get from the district in trying to help support that? Yeah. So I don't know if I doubt any of my uh, coworkers. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble either. That's not the, that's not the point of it. So as the tech ed in a whole, we get roughly $10,000. Now that's 
all the steel we need, bits when we break bits, lumber, all of our robotics equipment, our um, 3D printing material, all of that. That's absolutely everything. So if you think of like what it costs to really run a shop, for me to just run my welding classes, I'm dropping two grand in steel. Yeah. And that's with Ellis Manufacturing down the street donating me all their scrap. Oh. And so I'm still dropping two grand in steel to have kids weld. You know, and that's money. Yes, we can take that to scrapyard, but everybody knows what scrap prices are right now. Right. Not good. You know, and same with lumber. And we do charge a little bit to the students, but I charge $20 a kid to take my course. I can't, I can't ask for more than that because if I do that, I'm going to lose a lot of the kids that I need. And then you add consumables. That's not welding wire. That's not electrodes. That's not blades. That's not grinding wheels and all of that. And so it just, it really adds up. That's crazy. I never thought about that, but it, and even from the standpoint of you're, you're teaching them on these, right? So a grinding wheel that might last X amount of time for an experienced tech probably isn't going to last the same amount of time for somebody that comes in and is just grinding, like digging. I, right I had a kid it. last year that could make them disappear in two minutes. It's impressive. I don't even know how they do it. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that over, over and above just the numbers in general, and I appreciate you sharing with us that, that the numbers there, because I do think there's, there's so much benefit to industry understanding that piece of it. Right. And understanding that, yes, we want to build really strong programs on the technical education side, but there's not a lot of budget al uh, allocated to it. And even with you guys, I think, and we can talk a little bit about this, but with your, your new school, you've got a gorgeous new facility, one of the nicest high schools you'll ever see. And I, I don't know if that's middle school too or not, but it, it's a gigantic school. That, it's like a college campus. Just high school. Wow. I, I mean, it's a gigantic school. And the fact that you got a nice shop in the school, I think says a lot about the community that you're in, in terms of being able to, to get that in there. Now it's kind of taking that next step, right. And trying to get that industry support and trying to get people to help build a program that we can get more students in the seats. Am I, am I off base there? Nope. You're completely right. You know, they gave us a very generous budget because I came from a one, the old school had a one car shop. So I had one set of tools, I had one auto lift. And so they did open up and I managed to buy uh, two more two post lifts. I moved the one two post lift from the old high school to the new high school. And I put in a four post alignment rack, but I needed to buy tools. Yeah, I needed and I needed to start from scratch. I didn't have anything. You know, I, I went a little generous when buying them because I want I don't want that one 10 millimeter to be fought over by every student. And so I set up eight sets, eight full complete sets of tools. Good for you. And then I got into trouble with that because I went out for bids and the only people that responded was Snap-on. So now we opened the bids and I have to buy from Snap-on. Really? And so I ended up working with them and we ended up throwing away their quote and just building from scratch. And so we ended up it's all Williams brand, which is Snap-on's house brand. You know, it yep. comes up to be around the cost of Craftsman, so not terribly expensive. But I buy all of that. I had to buy floor jacks. I needed, you know, anybody that's brought up a, a garage or a shop from scratch understands those costs. And so I decided to pull the trigger on getting the four-post alignment rack. I still don't have an alignment machine. My budget was spent. Yeah. You know, I there's still a lot of things that I don't have that I need or would be nice to have because my budget was spent. Well, piecing it together basically. And, and just, that's where I think, you know, and this is all over the country where I hear very similar things to what you're saying, Ben, from schools that, Hey, you know, we could use more support in whether it's tools or training aids or, you know, whatever it is in, even over and above that, maybe just the, to have the conversation with surrounding shops. I know the challenges that you're putting up with right now with the virtual learning, I don't know how you teach a tech, a tech class, a tech ed class virtually and teach somebody how to weld or teach somebody, you know, how to change a tire, or, you know, whatever it is, 
I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but on top of your normal responsibilities, having to do that and deal with a pandemic, a, a worldwide pandemic at the same time is, is a lot. And I, I think that's where my plea to shops that listen to this and, and if it's text, you know, tell your shops about this, that, you know, if you're an alumni of a, of a school, try to go back and help them, try to figure out ways that, that you can help them. Let me ask you this, Ben, when you get a former student or uh, somebody from industry that wants to approach you and help you, are you able to take that help? Uh, like without, without it being a whole bunch of paperwork and everything like that? I will find a way to get it no matter what. Okay. I have found that Verona is very willing to, they, they, they basically leave me alone when it comes to that. Really? Um, if somebody wants to donate something, if you want the tax writer, I'll get you the tax writer. Okay. If you don't, drop it at the door. Nice. And that's, and they've done a, Verona's done a very good job of being hands off with that. Um, I haven't gotten too many options for donations, but I'm also, you know, the few that I have, they haven't even wanted the tax documents. They're like, here you go. And so it tends to be a pretty clean process. Okay. You know, as far as like buying something, that's where it gets messy. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where industry can help out a lot, right? Is not just going to a school and expecting that you're going to get a payday off of it because oftentimes there's just a, there's no budget and it's, it's really trying to figure out ways that we can get industry into the schools, try to help them generate interest in the program because that, that really at the core of it is what everybody in industry is complaining about right now is we can't get enough people in the industry. Well, we need to have more people participate earlier and try to try to really help these programs out, and especially somebody like you guys, Ben, where you've got a, a nice facility now, you've got a place to work, and you almost have to look at it from the standpoint of we're, we need to recruit some of these students, of those 1,700 that don't know who we are, we need to get them in there. And you know, I think I thought it was interesting for you, uh, and something that you said in in our conversation before was you know, it'd be nice to have maybe a vehicle that we could show off or that students built so that you can go down a parade with it and try to market the class a little bit. Yep. And it, it's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, is that what we've gotten at the point that we've gotten to where we need to show how, how, how cool it is to be able to work with your hands? Well, and that's, it's kind of the way that that's the way the ag department works here. It's the way our uh, cook, cooking and culinary arts classes are. It's, you have to find a way to market your program to get people interested. Wow. You know, it's really simple to bring in a bunch of rabbits and dogs and kids are going to flock to them. Yeah. It's not so easy to get kids to want to flock to the shop. And so, yeah, some sort of, you know, I don't care what kind of car it is, but yeah. you know, there's, I drive past a eighties Corvette every day on my way to work. The thing hasn't moved in six years. And I need to go knock on the door and say, hey, would you be interested? You know, I'm, I'm Ben from Verona Area High School. Would you be willing to donate it? And odds are the answer is going to be no. Right. But until like, but I need, I need to try to get something in the door. Yeah. That's, see, to me, there's a huge opportunity there, right? And that, that those schools that have a, we're not even fighting the need to have the class because you've already got the class. It's now trying to figure out how we support you and get you the resources that you need to be able to, to one market to these kids and tell them how great of opportunities are out there. And, and even that part. So do they fully understand or grasp the need for, uh, and it doesn't even have to be mechanics or techs. If, how, how big the need is for builders or for, you know, whoever it is, do they, do, do, do kids understand that? Some do, some don't. And the ones that do are definitely all in and they're interested. And, you know, those are the kids that come through the door and come find you every morning before school and come say bye to you every night before they go home. Or, you know, I had two dozen kids last year that, Hey, you want to open up the shop after school and we can come in and do stuff I'm like I'd love to, I can only do it a couple days a week, but yes, let's do that. Yes. And so the excitement is there. We just got to find a way to grow it. Interesting. This is, this is great stuff. Cause some of this stuff I'm just learning as we're talking uh, and, and 
obviously from a selfish standpoint, want to help the program out as much as possible, but really at the core of what we do, that's what we're, that's literally the conversation we're trying to have with schools and, and really anybody in the industry is how do we get everybody on the same team so we can help and, and really help drive more participation and fill those seats uh, and make it an exciting place to be. And that's, that's what I love about what you're doing, Ben, is just, I can see that and I can feel that part of you wanting to help kind of get all this together. So I, I, uh, I think it's pretty cool what you're building there. Thanks. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about what industry needs to do maybe better to support. And is it, is it something that can, can people come in and give a, uh, when we're in class, a, uh, maybe a, a talk to the class or can they do, you know, bring them into a shop and, show them around what a shop looks like. Uh, and I, like, what are some maybe examples of ways that a shop could help you out? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways. I've definitely brought in people from, last year it was second semester when I had all of my auto classes. So those got cut quite short. Uh, so I didn't get a chance to do a lot with the auto industry. Verona is also a weird area where there's three small auto shops and no dealerships. Yeah. Um, even though we have 1700 kids in our high school. But so, you know, I, in the first semester, I did a lot with the manufacturing industry in the area, which is fairly booming. There's some massive, massive industry in this area for manufacturing. And I went out and I made connections with a lot of them. And I just took my prep time, which meant that I had to prep at night, but whatever, the wife can deal with that. <laughs> And so I took my prep time and I went and met with industry and all sorts of stuff. And we actually set up a day to where we took 50 students and we walked through three different manufacturing facilities. Love it. Uh, we went through uh, Latitude Corporation down the road, which does a bunch of uh, CNC machining and precision welding and stuff. And they actually make uh, cruise missile frames for the U.S. government. Wow. Um, and they like that, that's a company that you walk through and you're like, holy cow. And the kids just loved it. They yeah. ate every minute of it. We went to Cleary building company that makes pole sheds in the area. Well, in the area nationwide now. And we checked out every aspect of that. They talked about the salesman aspect. We went through where they make trusses and do everything else and walk through their shop and, you know, just kind of work through all of that. And then we went through, uh, Playcon, which is a plastics manufacturer in the area also. And we got, we ended up getting uh, state some help from the district and we gave the kids lunch and they, they loved it. You know, it wasn't just where they got to get out of school for a day and we handpicked the 50 kids, the 50 kids that we knew were interested in this. Yeah. So do you see any opportunities for whether it's automotive or diesel to kind of do something similar? Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, there's there's chances I'm I was scheduled to have uh, Jason Herheim from MATC come yep. in and oh, Jason talk well. to my class um, and it just it didn't work out because we ended up getting closed down and I'm trying to set up with Jason right now to have him come into one of my daily zoom meetings with my students to have him talk to them having some uh, scheduling conflicts, but you know, have him come in and talk to them and you know, I'm all for service manager wants to come in, you want to bring a tech with, do a demo, do something that, you know, I was a diesel tech. I wasn't an auto tech. Yeah. There's stuff on cars that I'm learning along with my kids. Um, I'm teaching suspension this week. And I'll tell you what, suspension on a heavy diesel truck is very different. Than <laughs> <that car. laughs> and I tell my kids that too, is like, if I say something wrong, call me out because yeah. I'm probably wrong. That's even that to me is an opportunity for more, more help, right? Where if, if maybe a manufacturer or a dealership or even an independent has access to classes that are, you know, are not what you have access to at the school and can give you access to it. I mean, is that something that would help you or if you're taking a class at night or whatever that, that could help you maybe get more of an understanding of that side? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that would definitely help. Um, and then, you know, if they could spare somebody for an hour, or a couple hours in a day, come in and do a demo. Yeah. You know, if a local dealership brought in, you know, 
bring in a car, plug into it, get it to do some, you know, go on to the tech side of it to where they can't see and do some stuff. Like, you know, I've worked as a Komatsu tech for two years, bring a, bring a little excavator in, or, you know, that's a little ambitious, but a little wheel loader and start deactivating cylinders from the computer and kids are going to freak out. Yeah. They're going to love it. Well, and, and I, I look back, you were in Skills USA, and it's funny because we had a conversation prior to getting on the podcast, and I actually think I was a judge for you in Skill, Skills USA uh, back in the early 2010s, uh, and that is such a cool program because it does, it really emphasizes that critical thinking, and, and you were talking about the failure analysis and how, you know, how difficult that station is, or and not even difficult, but just how you're, it made you overthink it. Right. But mm-hmm. I think seeing that and being able to put a bug in a machine or being able to put a bug in a car and then showing, you know, truly like what you're talking about with a, an electrical short and then actually putting it into action on a car or a piece of equipment, it just shows the power of electricity or shows the power of uh, you talked about hydraulics when you, when you start to dive into hydraulics and hydrostatics, the, the power that you can generate from a piece of hydraulics is insane. Yep. And, you know, the more we can show that, I think that that really opens some eyes, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, I have a, I hope I can get my uh, advanced welding class running next semester, because there's a bunch of kids that I told like, hey, you know, if we can get through the curriculum fast enough, let's, so I got uh, Kohler Company donated me a bunch of small engines and I just said do you have anything diesel and they gave me two 18 horse two cylinder diesels love it and I told my kids like you know what if we get this like if we get through all of our curriculum let's see if we can build just a little bulldozer to put that little two that little two cylinder in that'll fit through a doorway and let's drive it down the hall and see who we can freak out I love it. That is an awesome idea. And it's something that's different that that really makes them think and is, you know, kind of is probably a paradigm shift to say, hey, there's some pretty cool stuff out there. Mm-hmm. I love it. I, I love what you're doing, Ben. I, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of everything that you're doing. And I think the exciting part to me and about this podcast that we we're doing right now is we're just identifying some ways that that industry can help and and really I don't think this is just just Verona either. I think all across the nation there are opportunities like this for community to get involved and 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 industry to get involved and help out their local schools. I don't know if you've got any any uh, associations with other uh, other teachers, but do you uh, do you do you kind of see that? I mean, is is there a craving for from the education side for industry to help out? Oh yeah, there's definitely a craving for that. And we're, you know, we're looking for anything. Um, yeah. I would love, I've actually been talking with a local scrapyard of like, hey, when someone brings in a car, any chance we can take it, let kids tear into it, like bring it here, drop it off, let kids tear into it. And then at the end of the year, come take it. That's a great idea. Like You're not losing any money. You're just not scrapping it at the moment you get it. Yeah. You know, maybe you're out 50 bucks in fuel and things like that. Um, I'm working on getting my program ASE certified, which is a very big process. You have to meet a lot of standards. You have to have a lot of equipment, but you also need two cars that are less than 10 years old. Really? And so I know uh, the automotive teacher over in Oregon, um, he had to go out and purchase a car because he couldn't find someone to donate something that was less than 10 years old. And then the only thing that he could afford out of his, or that the school would allow him to buy was a 2012. So in two years, it's it's man, that is good to know. That's good information. I had no idea about that. Yeah. So that's, it's one of the, to be, to get the student ASEs, it's, there's a lot involved. Um, I know other tech ed teachers that have brought their personal vehicle in and just been like, yeah, that belongs to the shop when the ASE guys are there. Yeah, I let kids take that apart all the time. Like, you know, and there's a brand new <laughs> car sitting in there like, no, that's but that's what you have to do to try to keep your certification. 
Well, and I, tech schools battle the same thing, right? And I, I, you know, my conversation with tech schools, they're having some of the same issues. Yours are magnified by the fact that like, if they don't think they've got a budget, you really don't have a budget. And to, to be able to try and drum up this stuff, I think this is a huge, huge thing that we need to, we need to have a really good candid conversation with industry to say, hey, listen, we need more help. Like there's, you want more people, that's great. We know we need more people, but until we change something at the root of this, there nothing's going to change. And I, I think we've we've got a long way to go before we get to that that really wake wake up point, or the, you know, the, really that that paradigm shift. But I uh, this this is great information, Ben. This is this is stuff I, I've learned a ton here today. Well, and I I hate to say this because I'm you know, I'm from the school aspect. I have worked in industry. And I don't want to tell people how to run their companies, but wages need to go up. Yeah. I hear from kids all the time. Why would I go work at a shop for ten, eleven dollars an hour when Target pays me twelve? Yeah. And they don't have to buy anything. Yep. They don't need to supply their own tools. They don't need to have that big investment. And you know, I hate to say that because there are a lot of small shops out there that are struggling. Yeah. I, I get they, they can't afford to pay more unless they increase their prices, but increasing prices means that there's some customers that are going to stop coming. Yeah. And it's a really slippery slope. It is. And that, that's, that's one of the big reasons we do this podcast, right? Is, is we want to help shop owners make more money so that they can ultimately pay more money to tax and try to, you know, it's kind of, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a big kind of circle that we just have to, to work on and try to make shops more money so that it is more prestigious to go in and be a tech and, mm -hmm. and that it is more rewarding because, and we use, we use an example all the time. Um, just East of Madison is a town called, I, I believe it's over by Beaver Dam. And over there, there's a Walmart distribution center that I think is starting people out at 20 bucks an hour. Yep. And we're expecting a young tech that comes out of tech school even to come in for less than 15 an hour and then put pressure on them immediately to perform where they could just go to that environment, not have to buy tools, not have to do anything and just go into it. So to me, there's a, that's another core issue of like, we do have to work on that. We do have to make sure that we're competitively paying. I am seeing a little bit of an adjustment, right? I, I think there are shops that are adapting and you're starting to see a lot more of those techs in that six digit range where they're making, you know, they're making significant money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's good. I think, you know, we, we're moving in the right direction, still have a long way to go. You kind of see the same? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been a while since I've searched for a job and yeah. the last time I did, uh, I was a fairly experienced tech. So it wasn't, it was pretty easy to walk in and have an open conversation about wages because I wasn't talking starting wages. Right. But I'm also, you know, I, I, I'm sure when I said, you know, 10, 11, $12 isn't enough. I would just like to put that in context where I live in Dane County to where you can't even survive on 60,000 a year. Right. A single income of sixty thousand a year is almost poverty line here. Yeah, and that's just that's the nature of where we live. Yeah, it's an expensive area for sure. And just outside of, uh, for those of you not familiar, just outside of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, college town, and and uh, a, a very nice uh, city, it, it is uh, it is expensive uh, to live there. But yeah, I I uh, I agree. Uh, is there? You know, when we when we talk about it, we'll, we're kind of running up on our time here. But when we talk about the industry as a whole, do you see any issue with what we're selling to technicians to get in the industry as compared to what the actual reality is? Right. So whether it's from a college recruiter that's telling them, hey, come to our school because you can make, you know, big money? Are we, are we selling them the wrong things? Are we selling them, uh, you know, maybe an inaccurate view of what real life is like when you do become a tech? Um, I think that we actually need to, at least from what I've seen of this area, we need to actually sell them. Really? I think the problem is there isn't enough talk of, hey, come be a tech. 
And then there's been such disservice to the industry through media and everything else that like people need to, people don't understand. You walk into dealerships and shops nowadays, they're not greasy, grimy, grungy places. They're clean. They're spotless. Yeah. Um, I know there was one job that I worked out of tech school that when we went home at night, we took a floor scrubber to our bay. And it was, if you didn't, you got pulled into the service manager's office and talked to the next morning. And that's what we need to push. You know, I, and I get my kids that in here every now and then are just like, well, it's a shop. It should be dirty. No, it shouldn't. You put oil dry down, you clean it up. Yeah. You make a mess, you clean it up. This place is as clean as it was when you started and it should be as clean as it was the day it was built. I love that because that's that's life skills that every shop manager that's out there right now is like, yes, that's what we're trying to like. That's something just from a, a, a employee standpoint in general. That's what you want is that initiative and that, you know, that that mindset. So when they do start le- learning the technical skill, like you, you're building on good habits and, you know, good things that should set them up for success going down the road. So. Well, I, I, I think we're about out of time, Ben, but I, I, I'm just fascinated by what, what you're doing there. And, and I think you've, you've really kind of triggered some thoughts in my head now as far as ways to, to try and help you out and trying to get more involved just from the finder wrench or wrenchway standpoint, but also shops, like trying to make introductions and trying to help bridge those relationships. Because I do think there's a lot of benefit when industry does help and whether it comes in a, in the form of a speaker or a training aid or, you know, whatever it is, I think having the open lines of communication with the school to understand what they need might be the most important part. And I, I appreciate you for, for kind of diving into this today because I, I thought it was just outstanding information. Yeah. And local shops, if they reach out, you know, I'm, I'm working on setting up an advisory board locally and most tech ed teachers and school districts would appreciate that too. Like get an advisory board together of the local shops, the area shops, all of that, whether they're private, whether they're dealerships, whatever, and see if you can pool your resources to be able to, all right, they need, you know, like personally, I need an, an alignment machine. All right if this person can put in 500 and this person can put in 500, it really reduces the burden because then one person isn't trying to take on the whole thing. Yeah. Well, and you look at the, uh, the instructor that, or the teacher you were talking about that had to basically provide his own car to the department. I mean, that's, that's something where, you know, there's a trade in somewhere, you know, there's something out there that a shop could donate or a dealership could donate that helps you get that, that criteria. That's, that's what we need to do. We need to bridge that communication gap to help these schools out, help them help them build these powerhouse programs that will end up benefiting everybody. And once we do that, you know, I think there's that's when we're going to start to see the turn in the industry. I, I think it's going to take a little bit of time yet, but that's that's the way I look at it. Hopefully, you know, it sounds like Ben and I are on the same page. Now we need to get kind of everybody in the industry on the same page. So uh Ben, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It was really a pleasure to, to meet you and understand more of what you got going on over there and, and uh, look forward to, to really getting to know you more. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks.